Well, it's good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, if you haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Ryan. I'm blessed to serve as a lead pastor here at Awaken and uh, blessed to be able to continue in this series. Man, last week, Pastor Josiah delivered a powerful word that spoke to our identity. And, and what we're going to see this morning as we shift and, and focus on chapter four uh, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians is really a, a shift in focus for Paul. Because right, in the first few chapters of the book of Ephesians, he's really establishing our identity. Right, we've been talking for a few weeks now about our firm foundation in Christ. But now Paul is going to shift the focus to help us to see how we are to live in light of this identity that we've received. And I think this is really important because if we are truly citizens with the saints in heaven, like we talked about last week, if this is true of our identity, then we need to understand that our citizenship, it comes with certain rights, and it also comes with certain responsibilities. Let me explain what I mean, okay? For, for most of us, we are citizens of the United States. And what that means is that we have been blessed with certain rights, okay? We have, we have the, the right to worship as we please. We have the right to vote, the right to run for office. But with those rights come some responsibilities, Right? We have the responsibility to obey the law. We have the responsibility to, to serve on jury duty if we're called. In other words, our, our citizenship here in this country gives us a tremendous amount of freedom. But it also calls us to live by a certain standard, to make use of those freedoms, those rights we've been given, but not to neglect our responsibility to others. Does that make sense? And I think the same can be said on a, a much larger, much more eternal scale when it comes to our identity as citizens with the saints in heaven. This is what Paul is going to call us to respond to. And he's going to use this phrase, he's going to say, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you've received. In other words, to live lives here and now that reflect your citizenship in heaven for eternity. But when you read phrases like that, I don't know if you're like me, but it, it sounds a little vague, right? Like, what does it mean to actually walk worthy? What is truly expected of me? Like, like God, just, just give me the list so I can check off the boxes and make sure that I'm doing everything that is expected of me. Right? What is expected of us in light of this new identity? What does it mean to walk worthy? Well, rather than answer that question, I'm going I'm to keep you hanging for just a second here. I actually want to answer that question with an image. This right here is a picture of a sentinel. This is a member of the United States Army's 3rd Infantry Regiment. This is the regiment of soldiers that are tasked with keeping guard over the tomb of the unknown soldier at Arlington National Cemetery. This tomb, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it serves as a, as a symbolic grave for those who gave their lives defending our freedom, but who were never either found or identified. And this tomb, it's had a soldier guarding it for every minute of every hour of every day since July 2nd, 1937. In case you're wondering, that is 31,621 days straight. And if, you, if you've ever been to see uh, these soldiers keeping guard over the tomb, it, it looks at first to be kind of a boring assignment, okay? Like, don't get me wrong, I feel like there's more adventurous things that some of our military are called to do. Okay, these soldiers, they, they essentially walk 21 steps in one direction. They do this cool turn, and they click their heels together, and then they walk 21 steps back in the other direction. And they do this over and over again. Again, it's not exactly the most adventurous assignment in the United States military. And yet it's one of the most coveted. In fact, I learned this week that uh, the, the, the badge that's awarded in this honor, it's the second least awarded badge in the United States Army after only the astronaut badge. So very few soldiers are chosen to serve in this way. And for those who choose to serve this way, those who are selected... They have to commit to six months of intensive training. I know what you're thinking. Yes, it takes six months to learn how to do that. But they commit to this six months, and then that's followed by two years of their lives spent serving at this post and living in the barracks underneath the tomb. But that's not all. Because even after those two years, these soldiers, they have to commit to not drinking or swearing in public for the rest of their lives. This is an image of what it looks like to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. But what's most incredible to me, it's, it's not the training or even that lifelong commitment that they make. It's actually the way they carry themselves when they are on the mat, as they call it. 
It is their dedication not to vary by a single step for a single second. No matter the weather, no matter the hour, no matter if there is a huge crowd watching them or if there is nobody there at all. Because for these soldiers, missing a step is missing this opportunity that they have been given to stand with those who stood before them. To honor the lives of those who gave their own for the freedom that we all know today. And I can only imagine that in, in the minds of those soldiers, as they're making those 21 steps, as they look out over the quarter million headstones that surround them, and that they're reminded that their freedom isn't free at all, that it came at a price, and that that price, family, is worthy of their walk. How much more should we then, having received God's grace because of the sacrifice of Jesus, how much more should we desire to walk worthy? to live the kind of lives that honor and reflect the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. No matter the weather, no matter the hour, no matter whether there is a crowd of people watching us or if there is nobody there at all. This is the opportunity that you have been given as a follower of Christ. So the only question is, what are you gonna do with this opportunity? Right, because you can choose to continue sleepwalking your way through life or you can choose to live wide awake and to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So family, my prayer for you today is that God would open your eyes up to this incredible opportunity that you have been given, that you would see yourself like this soldier, like this sentinel, only you haven't been selected to, to, to represent a nation. You have been chosen to represent a kingdom. Okay, when you walk worthy of that calling and you honor and you reflect the sacrifice that's been made not just for you but for others as well so excited to get to this word this morning but let's pause just for a moment let's ask the lord to guide us father we thank you for your grace we thank you for your mercy lord we thank you that you have found us worthy to carry your name ask lord that you would continue just speaking to us this morning would you guide us would you challenge us would you equip us through your word, by the power of your spirit, so that we might walk confidently in our identity in Christ. It's in his mighty name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, as I mentioned earlier, chapter four in Ephesians, it really represents a, a bit of a shift. It's sort of a, of a hinge chapter, where we go from understanding our identity to then figuring out how we are to live this out. So it's kind of like if you've ever taken driver's ed, I don't know about you guys, I took it in school. And so you take it in the classroom and you're learning all these things, but then you actually have to get out on the road and actually start doing it, okay? And it's a whole different ball game. And so we understand our identity. Now let's actually put that into practice. Well, for us, thankfully, the good news is we are not like the soldiers, the sentinels that guard the tomb. They have to memorize just pages and pages of history and, 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 and procedures. But for us, we're blessed because God is the one who sets our direction. God's the one who sets our direction. And we're going to see that in these first several verses in Ephesians chapter 4. So if you've got your Bibles or Bible apps, I encourage you to open those up. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 today, beginning with verse 1. Paul says this, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now there is a lot of good theological language in there. But right in the, in the midst of it, Paul, he lays out in very plain terms what it means for us to walk worthy. And see, I think the problem is that we tend as Christians to make things a whole lot more complicated than they need to be. See, we feel like we need to be the ones to, to create this masterpiece, to sort of to paint the Mona Lisa. When in reality, God has given us simple direction. It looks a lot less like the Mona Lisa, a whole lot more like a paint by numbers sheet. Are y'all following me? Does that make sense? Some of you are realizing like, yeah, I think I've kind of done that, Pastor Ryan. I make this a whole lot more complicated than it needs to be. But family, this life we've been called to live, right, walking worthy, it's not that complicated. Right? When you get down to it, God sets our direction right here. 
He tells us how to color in those boxes. He says, be humble, be gentle, be patient, love one another. Do you know how many problems we can solve? How many people we could reach? How many lives would be changed if we did just those four things and literally nothing else? Think about how complicated we make our lives, how complicated we make our churches. Man, if we just focus on these four things, this is the direction God sets for us. Right? Those sentinels, they make 21 steps. God gave us four. <laughs> he gave us four. The question is, are you walking in them? Are you practicing humility? Are you working on being more, more gentle, more patient, more loving? I hope that that answer is yes. But I want to encourage you, would you actually take a moment and actually do some self-assessment? I know that the tendency is to be like, yeah, I, I, I need to do that. But actually think about this for a second, okay? And, and if you're having trouble doing that self-assessment, I want to actually paint a little bit of a picture here for you using Paul's own, own words. This word that he uses as, as worthy, it literally means to be of equal weight. Of equal weight. So I want you to think of one of those old-timey weighted scales. I think we've got a picture of one. You guys know what this is? What he's saying is that your desire in pursuing humility and, and patience and gentleness and love, it should be to do so to the point where your life, it measures up to the blessings that have been talked about in the first few chapters. Your life should measure up. It should look similar to the life that Jesus lived. In other words, where these qualities of, of gentleness and patience and love, they go beyond just being qualities and they actually become actions. They actually become things that, that bear fruit in your life. Because you might say, yeah, you know what, Pastor Ryan, I'm, I think I'm a pretty humble person. Well, that's great, but, but your humility has been given to you as a gift to serve and to bless others. Y'all see what I'm saying? Like, these are great personality traits, but they're supposed to be more than that. It's supposed to be lived out, right? Gentleness is a great quality, but it should be lived out through acts of compassion towards others. Patience, same thing, right? It should be revealed to others in the way we, we show them mercy, the way we forgive them, the way we, we, we love on them. And the same thing with love, right? It should be displayed through acts of sacrifice. See, when it comes down to it, I really don't think that this Christian walk is all that complicated. It should be easy for us to understand what it looks like to walk worthy. The challenge comes in actually like living this out, right? In the midst of broken people when we ourselves are broken. By right, taking these theories that we've learned in our head and these things, you know, like, like Pastor Josiah shared about our identity last week, actually putting that into practice. But the good news is that we're not left on our own to do that. Because not only has God set our direction, but my second point this morning is that he surrounds us with one another. He surrounds us with one another. Paul points us to this truth in verses 7 through 14. You can join there with me now. He says, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Now again, we see some major theological points that Paul is laying out here, but don't miss the simplicity of what he's calling out. Right, that just as God sets our direction, he has also surrounded us with fellow soldiers, so to speak, in order to accomplish his mission. And this should point us to a couple of important truths that I want to just highlight for us this morning. The first is that the church is God's plan A to reach the world, and there is no plan B. I think that bears repeating. That the church is God's plan A to reach the world, and family, there is no plan B. Right, that just as Jesus came to the world as the visible image of an invisible God, so now we as the church are to be an image of Jesus to the world. Are y'all with me? Here's why I think this is important to call out. Because I think most Christians, maybe even some of you here in the church, you don't really exactly see the church as God's plan A. I'm just, I'm just 
being honest here, okay? Because what I see around us, what I see in the church, is a lot of people who, who, who come to church, but they don't see it as, as God's plan A. And you know how I know this? It's because they'll, they'll, they'll pray these prayers, right? These, these, these silver bullet, quick fix prayers like, Lord, would you, would you help my marriage? Would you, would you balance my finances? Would you help me with this identity crisis? And then Sunday rolls around and, and, and you know, football's on and, and, and kids have sports and all that sort of stuff. I don't think they see the church as God's plan A. Maybe, maybe, maybe if enough time goes by, maybe they've prayed these prayers long enough and they get so desperate, maybe then they'll go and they'll see if somebody at church can help them. But I don't know about you, when I look at this letter, it's clear to me that the church, and when I say the church, I mean the people, not the property, that's important, is that the church is where God wants to use his power. This is where he's placed his people. This is where he's poured out his gifts, right? And I'm not saying that the God's like only limited to the church. God, God can do whatever he wants, but it's pretty clear that this is where he wants to do his work. So why would we go looking somewhere else? Family, the church is God's plan A to reach the world. He has surrounded us with fellow soldiers for a reason. And when we start to see the church that way, maybe others will start to see it that way too. Think about that for a second. Leads me to another important truth that's underlying these verses. The truth is this, that coming to church is not the same thing as being the church. Coming to church is not the same thing as being the church. When we look at verses 11 and 12, we see Paul talks about the fact that God, he, he gives these certain gifts, certain roles for the church. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. And what typically happens for us is we read passages like this and we tend to, to overemphasize or hyper-spiritualize the people who are serving in those roles. But the reality is that each and every one of us has a role to play in the church. That each and every one of us, no matter our gifting or our position, has a place and a purpose in the body of Christ. And that purpose, as we talk about each and every week, is to be the church, to invest in one another, right? to build one another up, and to use those unique gifts that God has given each and every one of you to equip others. When you think about those sentinels, those soldiers who are guarding the tomb, this is how they've been able to do that every single minute of every single hour of every single day for almost 90 years. It's not because they relied on one guy to do the whole thing. It's not because they relied on just a few leaders to go and do it. No, they knew it would take every single one of them to accomplish the mission. They knew it was going to take every one of them. So listen, I hope this goes without saying, but, but, but I'll say it anyways. Our vision as a church is that we would not be a group of people that come to, to bask in the gifts of our leaders, but that we would be a group of people who are equipped and empowered to be leaders ourselves. And that's not some new ministry model. <laughs> that's not just our vision. That's God's vision. Look at what Jesus did. Jesus spent just three years with a dozen knuckleheads, and then he was like, see ya. You got this. We've been in church for five years. We got no excuses. What's amazing is we were sitting around our pastoral team this week. We were talking. And as much as we want to see this bear more fruit, we're seeing this in some really, really incredible ways. We're seeing this in ways that prove that you don't need a seminary degree to do the work of ministry. Shoot, we've got students over here, they don't have a high school diploma, some of them don't have driver's licenses. And they're making a huge impact in the kingdom. And I'll tell you what's so upside down crazy about this, is that we've got seniors in high school who are doing the intentional work of discipleship, and we've got senior citizens who are laying their lives down in sacrifice and serving in the, in the most humble of ways. And when you look outside the church walls, they would say, that is crazy. The young people should be doing the work and the older people should be the ones being served, not in the kingdom. That's not how it works in the kingdom. No one is too young to make an impact. No one is too old to serve. Amen? It's time we start pushing back against this picture of a church being a group of people coming to bask in the gifts of a leader. It's time we start embracing the responsibility to be leaders ourselves. Now, I know there's a lot of good biblical truth in there, and it's kind of like, okay, giving that little pep talk, but I want this to be more than a pep talk, so let me make the spiritual practical here for just a moment. Let me just give you a suggestion. 
Because I think, again, we read a verse like this and we see all those giftings and you have this tendency to think, well, am I one of those? Do I have those, those giftings? It's not a bad question to ask, but let me suggest that you ask this first. Ask, do I have any of these influences in my life? Do I have any influences like these in my life? Am I counting on those that God has already placed in my life to build me up so that I might build up and bless others? I think that's such a wonderful place to start. And the good news for you is we have these in spades here. And just in case you didn't know this, they don't all carry the title of pastor either. If you're part of our life groups, you know this. We have incredible people who have been incredibly gifted and are ready to pour into your life. Do you have these influences in your life? Start by asking that question and then when you take the responsibility you have been given as a citizen with the saints in heaven. Right, don't just take all those, right, all those rights, but recognize that you've also been given a responsibility. Receive that responsibility. Because the truth is, friends, whether this is your first Sunday here with us at Awaken or whether you've been coming since we launched, we need you. We need you. And the truth is, whether you've been, been walking with Jesus your whole life, whether you, you spent a season that, where you walked away from him, or whether you walked in those doors knowing nothing about him, we need you too. Yes, I may have been gifted to do certain things that you can't do, but y'all have been gifted to do things that I can't do. And that is not some sort of uh, uh, design thing that, that, that God missed in his creation of the church. That's not some flaw. That is actually a design feature. He actually created us to be that way. He created us to need each other. So we can keep coming to church and viewing it that way, and we'll end up like these children that Paul talks about, flipping and flopping and floundering in the waves. Or we can start being the church. We can see growth. We can see maturity. We can see unity. We can see all those things that come by living lives that are fully engaged. Family, that's the mission. That's the mission. And not only has God set our direction, not only has he given us the incredible example of Jesus and surrounded us with each other to accomplish that mission, but he also gave us Jesus as our source of growth. That's our third point this morning. Look with me, if you would, at verses 15 and 16. Paul says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint from which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I love this little passage because what Paul does is he, he paints sort of a, a dual picture. Right? He's, he calls Christ the head of the church. And what he's trying to get across to us is the fact that, that Christ not only leads by example, but that he's also one who's driving everything that's, that, that's going on inside of us. Okay, that he's not just our example, he's also the engine. He's not just our model, he's also the motor. Does that make sense? I think this is important for us to understand because I think our tendency is to overemphasize our own role or to de-emphasize Jesus' role in our transformation. So we may see Jesus as the example, but we see ourselves as the engine. Maybe I'm the only one here who, who does that. What happens when we see ourselves as the engine? Is we put ourselves on the fast track to spiritual burnout. I think this is why so many young people are leaving the faith. It's because they think it's all up to them, right? So somebody did a good job of setting Jesus as the standard, but neglected to tell them that he is also the source of their growth. And I know this because this was true of me, right? I grew up in church. I knew all the stories. I knew very well what the standard was in Jesus. But I didn't know until much later in life that he was also the source that would energize me to meet those standards. So listen, family, I want to make absolutely sure you understand here today. I want to make absolutely sure that you understand that God's desire for us as individuals, and as a church, that we would grow into Christ through the power of Christ. That we would grow into Christ through the power of Christ. But let's talk about what that actually looks like, okay? Because, again, I think we're just breaking down these misconceptions, breaking down these expectations and these standards that we've put on ourselves, that scripture doesn't say that. Because what happens when you make this shift in your mindset and start seeing Jesus as the source of your growth, do you all of a sudden you know, achieve sainthood? 
right? Do you call up the Vatican and say, hey, as you start building that statue, I've reached the peak? No, of course not. What happens is you start to see these moments of small incremental growth. And I think this is important for us to understand, right? Because we'll have these, these incredible, spirit-filled, mountaintop moments. And then we'll turn around a week later and be like, I'm still that same broken, messed up person I've always been. Right? I remember coming home from a junior high camp once and, and I, I threw away all my rap CDs and I was like, all right, everything's changing. And then like a week later, I'm just back doing the same exact thing. And it's defeating, isn't it? See, but the reality is our spiritual growth doesn't work in this way. Think of it this way, okay? I'm not sure if you guys ever grew up like this, but in my grandparents' house, the house that I was even brought home to as a baby, they've got this door. It's in like their hallway, just a closet door. But on that door, you've got like some little marks and have some names and some dates written next to them. And on this door, if you were able to see it in person, you'd be able to see how tall I was when I was three years old and seven years old and nine years old and all, all the way up. Now my kids' names are on there showing how old they were at those ages. But the question is, right, do you feel that growth on a daily basis? No, of course not, right? My parents, did they see that growth? No, probably not, right? Because we don't grow like that. Our physical growth, it's a, an ongoing and continual process. It's incremental. It's the same thing when it comes to how we grow up into Christ. So should our desire be to, to grow and to mature every day? Absolutely. Should we expect to see that growth every single day and, and experience it? Uh, probably not. But that's where faith comes in. That's where faith comes in because we have to trust in faith that God is going to grow us through his word even on those days where it feels so mundane. We have to trust in faith that God is going to grow us through prayer even in those days where we don't really have any words to say. We have to trust in faith that God is going to grow us through worship and through sacrifice even when life is hard and we just don't feel like it. Because in doing these things, family, by trusting in faith, we allow Christ to be the one to grow us for his glory. It's like I said earlier, we make these things a whole lot more complicated than they need to be. Right? It's actually really simple. If you want to see growth, stay connected to the source. If you want to see fruit in your life, stay connected to the vine. And then what you'll notice is when you look back over a year, over two years, over a decade, over a lifetime, is the, the transformation and the fruit that Christ has produced in and through you. So yes, we may not be able to see the full masterpiece of our lives, but God can. God can. And what he's done through his word is he's given you the opportunity, family, simply to paint by the numbers. So as I invite the band back up, I want to just revisit those simple steps this morning. I want to give you a few simple ways you can make the spiritual practical. A few ways you can paint by the numbers in your own life. Because here's what I actually found out this week. I didn't actually do any painting by numbers, although I may do that this afternoon with my kids. But I actually found out in doing a little bit of research that painting by numbers has been scientifically proven to reduce anxiety, to create focus, and to promote mindfulness. Isn't that interesting? Painting by numbers reduces anxiety, creates focus, promotes mindfulness. And I thought, man, if we were just to see our faith that way, if we were just to see our spiritual walk in that same way, I think we would experience the same result. Not only that, we would see God's church grow for his glory. So what would it look like for you to color in those boxes today? To be humble, to be gentle, to be patient, and to be loving. What would it look like for you to live those things out right here at Awakened Church? Because what starts right here, family, has the ability to change the world. What would it look like for you to be humble? You know, we've got dozens of people who gave of their, their time and their talent right here, selflessly. But I also know there's some of you who have yet, not yet taken that step. And the truth is, we need you. Like I said earlier, we need you. And God didn't bring you here to be a spectator. He brought you here to participate and he gave you a specific purpose. Would you humble yourself to discover what that is and would you use it for God's glory? So be humble, be gentle. Would you speak truth to one another in love? And don't forget that second part. And this is why life groups and discipleship are so crucial, so important to the, the life of our church. 
much we say that church happens more between Sundays than on Sunday because in order to walk worthy seven days a week, right? In order to walk worthy, no matter if anybody's watching or if, if we've got a crowd watching us, man, we need that gentle accountability in our lives. Be patient. This one's the easiest one. Just let go of everything. Let God do what he's got to do. Stop thinking that you're the engine. Stop thinking you got to be the motor. Let God be the one who drives you. And lastly, bear with one another in love. In other words, endure together. Because here's the hard truth. Being a part of a, of a church body, it's not unlike being a part of a family. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be let down. You're going to be hurt. Bear with one another in love anyway. If you live in humility, if you can be gentle and patient with one another, family, then real relationships will be forged and the church will be stronger for it. Can you imagine just for a moment the kind of impact our church can have if we colored in these four boxes? Can you imagine how many, how many people we could reach, how many lives could be changed if we all did just these four things? I can promise you, family, God is up to something big here. Would you just do your part? I'd like to ask you if you would, just to stand. As I close out our time together in prayer, and I pray that our standing together would just be a, a simple outward display of the unity that exists in this body. If you would, if you would just open up your hands in that posture of surrender as we pray, Lord, we want to be used by you. We desire to, to live lives of worthiness. But we need you to guide us. Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters, for this incredible church family. I thank you for the purpose that you have put in their heart. Would you reveal that to them this morning? And would they be humble? Would they be gentle? Would they be patient? And would they bear with one another in love? For the sake of your kingdom and for your glory. It's in your holy name we pray, Jesus. Amen.